good evening, everybody. I'm actually really happy to see that there are more people now than during my lectures. <laughs> uh, and usually people do not clap when I arrive before my lectures either. So, well, yeah, tonight it's going to be, so first, a little talk about spiders. So why do we talk about spiders? Well, for plenty of reasons. One of them being that, well, obviously I'm interested. So we'll have a look at different aspects of spiders, but mainly, uh, are they really dangerous? How dangerous is their venom? Are they really deadly spiders? Or, yeah, what are really the myth? What's the truth? I was thinking about something more technical in the beginning, but I thought, nah, no, not for the evening. Like, you know, we're all waiting for a glass of wine later and all. So, <laughs> gonna keep it simple. So, first, very pretty picture, well, I took it, of a black widow, actually, that I photographed well in my office. Don't tell that to my colleagues. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was very pretty spider. So, why you talk on spider? Also, because of that. You all heard about it. There is no doubt. The false black widow. And you know, these terrible spiders that are coming after us to actually like bite us and kill us and stuff. So these are just some of the titles that were in the news uh, recently, in the past few months. So some of them are really trivial, they're almost a joke. Some others are actually quite tragic because of the outcome. But what I can tell you is that none of these titles are actually accurate. None of them tell the truth whatsoever. So, from the I nearly lost my hand to Britain's most poisonous spider, uh, to uh, where is it, a killer toilet spider, uh, <laughs> no, no, that does not exist, okay? To give you actually a real, true life experience, I did a project this year with my, one of my fourth year students, so Aileen, and that was about spiders, spiders distribution uh, in Galway, and we found false black, uh, false black widows. So we did a press release about false black widows. And it was a very serious press release saying that they are not dangerous and that, you know, we found so, uh, one or two specimens that is very interesting, we'll study them further. Now, what did we read in the newspapers a few days later? False alarm, nasty spiders invasion extend to the west. <laughs> so, you know, we really feel the kind of run now, you know. Um, what's kind of amazing is that we provided a picture of a false black widow. And actually I have one with me, you'll see it later. And uh, so a very pretty picture. What did they decide to put? They decided to put a kind of massive Australian huntsman as an illustration for it. Nothing to do with the false black widow. It's not like if they didn't have the material, no. The spider was not impressive enough for the article. This is plain lying, okay? So when you're reading horror stories about spiders and all in the newspapers, do not believe that. Really do not believe it. Same thing for the, uh, where is it, the 100 uh, deadly spiders uh, somewhere. Don't have it over there. Yes, horror as abandoned house infested with over 100 killer spiders. That wasn't the case at all. They actually calculated all the spiders as well. They put into account all the spiders that were in the house in the corner of the walls. So like the house spiders, the garden spiders. As far as I know, they are not deadly. They, they, they just belong there, okay? So really massive exaggeration. So we're going to take it from there and hopefully we'll change the um, usual media point of view on all these animals. So, little talks in four parts. First, an introduction about spiders. I'm going to tell a few generalities about them. Then I'm going to speak about just a few cool webs, traps, and camouflage used by spiders. Then, of course, we'll speak about venom. And finally, so we'll see if they are really deadly spiders and how many of them there are around. So, introduction. Absolutely beautiful um, picture of a logger face spider. Now, what's a spider? And when I have my slide, what's a spider? That's when I say hello to Elsa. Hello, Elsa. So, what's a spider? Well, a spider is, first, an eight-legged creature. So, eight legs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, with also a pair of feelers in front that they use, actually, to feel all the kind of prey and vibration in the ground that prey could, um, could produce. They have a body divided in two parts, a big belly over there and another bit in front where you have the eyes and all the legs are attached to. This is what we call the cephalothorax. 
Cephalothorax sounds very complicated. It means something very simple. Cephalo is the head, thorax is the chest. So cephalothorax is the head plus the chest attached together without a neck. And it's probably because spiders do not have a neck that we really find them creepy. But in fact, they tend to be very gentle. Well, Elsa at least is. Now, Elsa, can you climb my arm? <laughs> now, most spiders have eight eyes, tiny, tiny little eyes. Hopefully, later, when you come close, you'll be able to look at them. Then, they have also a pair of fangs. That's usually where all the horror stories come from. And a pair of venom glands attached to these fangs. Now, that should cover most of the generalities here. Yes, most of them are actually terrestrial. Some of them spend a lot of time in water. Actually, they make a little, uh, little bell underwater with silk, and they fill it up with air. So actually, they have a special little house underwater. So we could consider them semi-aquatic. And you could even say that some spiders have colonized the air. And that's something that most people do not realize. But you see, a lot of baby spiders make a long um, kind of sail with silk. And they can actually travel great distances. We're speaking about thousands of kilometers just hanging on to that sail. And we found them up to five or 6,000 meters in the air. So we could say that actually spiders have even colonized the air, which is fairly impressive. Now, spider diversity. So the first thing that I should say so is that spiders form a particular group that we call the order Aranea. And there are only one of 11 orders of arachnids, so of eight-legged creatures. So they're only a small subset of plenty of creatures that have eight legs and very similar characteristics. You know some of them, scorpions. But there are a lot of others. For example, the solifugies, so the sun spiders. We have also the vingaroon, guys that can actually throw an acid, a kind of vinegar, at, at you if you disturb them. Then we have also mites and ticks, they're actually close cousins of spiders as well. We have the Datinon legs, the opilios. They are not spiders, but they're very similar. And then we have also an inhabitant of Ireland, the pseudoscorpion. It's about this size, three millimeters. <laughs> but it does look like a scorpion, and that's fairly cool. So we have over 45,000 named species of spiders in the world so far. Probably that there are a lot more. We have been speaking about well over 100,000 species but we need more scientists to actually describe them. So that's the problem for the moment, is that we don't have enough people working in museums or in universities to describe all these species that we have around us. And question of size, they range so from 370 micrometers, that's, that's, that's tiny, that's 0 0.37 millimeters, okay? to over 30 centimeters in leg span. Now, I'm going to show you a specimen later. I, I, I can't really handle her. She'll like, eat me alive if she can. But she's, she's big. You'll see she's, she's set up really. Now, in Ireland. So that was in the world, but what about Ireland? Well, in Ireland, amazingly, we have 400, or maybe even over 400 species of spiders. We have over 600 species of mites. We have 12 species of ticks that are waiting to suck your blood. We have 18 species of daddy long legs as well. So you see, every time you see a daddy long leg, we are actually see different species of them. It's not always the same thing. And we have 17 species of those very small pseudoscorpions. Now, the largest species in Ireland, that's something else that needs to be answered. Because every year, I have people that come to my lab or to my office and say, I found a banana spider. Usually, it's a house spider. It's a common Irish house spider, but they get big. In fact, the giant house spider can get up to about 12 centimeters in lifespan. The size in lifespan to an average tarantula. So yeah, there are a lot of spiders in Ireland. And if you're really lucky, you might be able to see also the raft spider. So the raft spider lives in bogs, mainly. But these guys can be very, very impressive. They can reach 12 to 15 centimeters in leg span. Imagine a spider this size just crawling in front of you. That is very impressive. In fact, they're so large that they can catch fish. <laughs> That's awesome. So, <laughs> so if you're really lucky, in a bomb, you might be able to see those guys. Then, of course, most people think tarantulas 
cannot guarantee that in high and that's not possible. Well, in fact, there is one. Now, it is a tarantula, it belongs to the same family, so Atipus affinis, the first web spider. You see, straight fangs, absolutely massive, so definitely a tarantula. The only thing, of course, it measures about <coughs> 8 or 9 millimeters. So it's a tiny little thing, but we do have one species of tarantula in Ireland. Very important to precise. Then, a little word about the evolution of spiders, because that's also a fascinating subject. So, in fact, spiders exist for at least the past 400 million years. So, of course, that means that they are older than the oldest dinosaurs. They are really ancient creatures. And being ancient in evolution is a good thing, because if you still exist today, it means that you've been super successful and adaptable for the past 400 million years. So whatever they do, they do it super well. Then, so it evolved, or spiders evolved, from kind of giant, marine, scorpion-like creatures. It's very interesting animals also to study or just uh, to discover on the internet or anything. So ancestral spiders are surprisingly similar to modern day, day spiders. These guys are 400 million years old. If I just see one today, I immediately say, oh, spider, or oh, that you know, So you see, very, very similar to actually we have nowadays. And then, one of the most ancient group of terrestrial venomous animals. They're actually competing the title of oldest terrestrial venomous animal with the centipede on one side and the scorpion on the other. Around 400 million years to 450 million years. So very, very ancient venom um, there as well. And now, still nowadays, you can find really kind of living fossils in the spider world. One of them is this mesotele. This mesotele from Southeast Asia, so it's all over 300 million years old, they still live today, unfortunately, they will probably be extinct very soon because there are not many of them, they're very interesting and that means that there are many collectors around the world that are willing to pay very good money to get one of those. So there are less and less of them in the wild, unfortunately. No, spiders have fascinated people for a long time. Basically, they fascinated people since they are people. So just to give you an idea, a few stories there. So for example, we will find in West Africa a lot of myth about uh, God, the God who knows all stories, basically a storyteller God. And that God is uh, the um, Kwaku Anansi. And Kwaku Anansi, quite interestingly, uh, became um, anti mansi in the US, in the southern states. So it is something that became kind of global and very interesting to see that spiders can have also kind of a good role, even though in some parts of Africa it's kind of a storyteller that also tricks people, tricks people all the time. So only partly a uh, positive um, character. Then we have another character, I won't even pronounce that word. <laughs> okay, my Navajo is probably a little bit rusty, so I won't try. So basically, the creator of the world and the stars, so really a central character of the Navarro Pantheon, is a spider. So you see how fascinating this animal can be. And then, of course, we have Arachne versus Athena in Greek, uh, ancient Greek uh, culture. So basically, Arachne was the daughter of a uh, clothes seller. And she was very, very good at weaving. In fact, she was so good at weaving that she said she was the best in the world. Athena didn't like that because she was the goddess of weaving. So basically, they ended up having a competition. They were both weaving madly. And it seems that Arachne won. Athena wasn't too happy that Arachne kind of, um, you know, was just very proud of that. And uh, so Athena, who was a goddess, very powerful, turned her into a spider, just like for revenge. So that's another story. And then we have also the myth of the Tsushikumo uh, yokai in Japan. And finally, we have a story that I love, grandmother spider that gave the sun to the Cherokee people. Just Google that, read the story, it's fantastic. Basically, plenty of animals try to go on the other side of the world to get the sun and give it back to the Cherokee people. 
and they all get burned. So basically, that's why, uh, for example, the vulture doesn't have hair on its head anymore because of because he was trying to carry the sun on its head and it got burnt and he lost the sun. And the spider came and said, hey, I'm tiny, but I can do it. And the spider made a little pot and then made a thread of silk to the other side of the world. And she just sneaked to the other side of the world. Nobody on the other side of the world saw her. And then she managed to steal the sun, put it in the pot, and run away back to the Cherokees. <laughs> and so since then, the Cherokees have, uh, have the sun. They're very happy people and they can tame grandmother spider. See, really, they have that central role in me all around the world. I find that fantastic. Now, a quick part so back to reality, real spiders, webs, traps, and mimicry. So, you see, a lot of spiders we use mimicry or in order either to approach their prey without being noticed, that's what we call offensive or aggressive mimicry, or simply to not get eaten by a bigger animal. We call that defensive mimicry. So, for example, here you have a huntsman spider, very, very well camouflaged. So, you see, it's really impressive how they can just mix with the background. So, question of webs. First thing, which I'm sure you all know a few things about webs. First important thing about it, there are seven different types of webs that uh, each spider can produce. They do not use the same spiders or the same, uh, the same spiders, the same web, or the same web-making cells, glands, to produce, for example, their main web on which they're going to hunt, and the web they use to protect their eggs. Each different task will require a different type of web, and I find that quite interesting. In fact, if you ever wonder how spiders can walk on their web without, like, being stuck to it, it's because they know where to walk. Not all threads are sticky. And they know exactly where they can walk and where they cannot walk. So they produce different kind of silk depending on uh, the place or the, 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 the location, you know, on the web where they want to put sticky web or if they want to put something that's non-sticky, if it's actually a drag line to just pull the rest of the web. And each type of web has different characteristics. But what we can recognize question of characteristics is that web are at least as solid as steel for the same thickness. Often it is even more solid than steel. But what's more interesting is that it is as solid as steel and 150 more stretchy than steel. This is where it gets very interesting because it means that actually it has some flexibility to it as well. And of course this has interested now for a good while the industry, pharmaceutical and also uh, engineering industry, and now they are products that are derived from the web. So for example, you can expect that in the coming 20 years, a lot of your stitches, if you have to go to hospital, will be derived from silk protein. You can expect that uh, bulletproof jackets for policemen, same thing in the coming 15 to 20 years, or at least for elite force, will be made out of web-derived products. So there are loads of applications there. Another application, actually, is simply clothes. This cape has been done with the silk of two million spiders over the course of four years, hand waved. Absolutely amazing work. It's been done in Madagascar with a particular species called Nephila. And what's interesting as well is that that color, it's not dyed. This is the natural color of the silk. It's absolutely amazing. But I don't want to know the price of that cake. Because <laughs> four years of work, two million spiders, ah, that's going to cost a bit. Uh, what's very nice as well is that the spiders were used for a day and then released. And then they catch new spiders, use them for a day, and then release them. So actually they produce that cloth with spiders that did not suffer at all. So it was fairly ethical. Now, traps. You all know the usual web. So I'm not going to speak about that, especially there are plenty of documentaries and all about it. I'm just going to show you four different types of traps that special <coughs> spiders use. So for example, the Bola spider, right here, manage to catch moth by making a lasso, a bola. Basically, it makes a silk of thread, and at the bottom of that thread, 
there is a little drop, a very, very, very sticky drop. Now, when the moon is shining at night, that little drop shines as well. Moths are really attracted by light. So what they do is that they just start to turn it like this into a circle. They use their legs for that. They use two legs, really like a cowboy would use a lasso with two hands. They really do that. And when the moth approaches, they throw it at it. The moth is stuck. They just bring it back. And well, the rest is not that cute. You know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the bola spider. Then, if I go here, we have the ogre face spider. So the ogre face spider basically makes a web that has the shape of a net. And it's going to cast this net. So it can cast it at a distance, and it will catch whatever passes by. It can be a net, it can be a moth, it can be a fly. Well, it will catch anything it can, but by casting a net on that prey, a sticky net, which is really impressive. Once again, go on YouTube, you will find footage absolutely fantastic. Ogre face spider. I'm going to show you actually a little video clip now of a trapdoor spider. Now, trapdoor spiders, I don't know if you've seen them in action before. Absolutely fantastic animal. It's going to go fast. I'm not going to say anything. You'll understand why we call them trapdoor spiders. Do that. I'm going to go there. I'm going to put it in full screen. And now, wait for it. Cricket happy. No more cricket. <laughs> trapdoor spider. Well worth <laughs> knowing. So these guys have become master at making very, very precise nests. And what's amazing as well is that all around that nest and that trapdoor, they have drag lines and they capture vibrations from all around there. So it basically works like a massive radar. And as soon as there is a little bit of vibration in the ground, all these drag lines will send tiny vibration to the spider inside the, the, uh, the, the hole. So they know exactly where there is a prey, how big the prey is, and probably what type of prey it is as well. So pretty clever. And finally, something else that you should look at, the spitting spider. Now, everything is in the name. That spider spits silk web at its opponent at a good distance, a fair few centimeters. And basically, it shoots silk like it would shoot again. It's very impressive. If you ever wonder if, uh, wondered if there was something true in Spider-Man, have a look at the speeding spider. It's exactly that. It approaches the other, the other animal, and at a distance, it just throws some uh, sticky silk there. And it basically covers its prey with silk. As you can see, it's well covered with silk. Then just go there and munch. So very clever little things. Now, mimicry. So mimicry in spider is fairly developed. Here are some extreme examples. Okay? Some of you might know already a couple of them. Another one's quite obvious, another one is, <laughs> is a surprise. So the first one, here, Serenia. Serenia is one of my favorites. The bird poo spider. <laughs> now, nothing matches that. So the bird poo spider basically looks like a bird poo. So that means that birds are not going to eat her because she looks like poo, and birds do not eat their poo. So basically, she's fairly safe for that. But second thing, she actually smells like poo. And when you're a spider and that you smell like poo, there is massive advantage. It means that flies come close to you. That means that basically she can stay there, very quiet because she knows that birds are not going to eat her, and she will also have food delivered to her, like. Yeah, everything. <coughs> so fantastic life for the bird to spider. Then we have that guy. Now, this one, of course, if you look at it just like that, you're gonna tell me, oh, it's a ant. Now I know it looks like an ant, but count the legs. Now an ant is an insect. So an ant has six legs. Now that guy has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Spider. So that's an ant. That looks uh, that's a spider. That looks like an ant and that's its end. So it's very handy because, of course, she can go in an ant nest, and then the ant just pass beside and go, oh, hello, ant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as, you, as soon as she passes by, bam, she can jump on it, eat it, and just throw it at the side, wait, another ant pass, oh, hello, bam. <laughs> so it's very handy. It's basically 
basically the equivalent of living in a giant fridge. Like, you know, <laughs> you just have food all around you. So, very, very good technique. Then, we have the spider that decided to look like a ladybird. Now, what's the advantage in looking like a ladybird? Well, ladybirds stink. Okay? They just, ladybirds just stink. So birds do not like eating them. So they have warning colors saying, don't even try to eat me. I'm not tasty at all. You're going to regret it. So that spider has taken exactly the same color. So she's basically sending the signal to all birds around, all predators around, don't even try to eat me. I, I, I'm not going to taste nice. But that's not true. In fact, she tastes very good. But it's a pretty good defense. And finally, we have another example of mimicry that is really good. So this is a little scientist, a little jumping spider. The thing is that, okay, the head is here, that's the abdomen, okay, so cephalothorax abdomen. But it looks like the predatory wasp that normally eat them. So it looks like a wasp that normally is a specialist in eating spiders. Basically, instead of looking just like, okay, that's the head of the wasp, that's the body of the wasp, no. Its butt is the head of the wasp. This is the head of the wasp. These are the antennae of the wasp. These are the mandibles of the wasp. This is the thorax of the wasp. And this is the abdomen of the wasp. And if you've seen a uh, different species of wasp, you would have noticed that a lot of them have a very, very narrow waist. Yeah? It's right there. So that guy decided to look like its main predator, so its main predator cannot see it anymore. Just saying that it's a friend and not food, which is very handy. So very amazing little creature as well. <coughs> now, part three, let's speak about venom. Beautiful fangs, as you can see. Fangs of a tarantula. Tarantula fangs work straight, like vertically. All the other spiders have fangs that work laterally. This is the difference between a megalomorph, a tarantula, and all the other spiders. Venom versus poison. So, first thing that I should say, spiders are not poisonous, they are venomous. So poison is a substance that is, that is toxic if you rub it on your skin or if you ingest it. Ingest a bottle of whatever toxic product, you're going to soon understand that, no, that was poison. You're puking your guts out, not going to work, poison. Now, venom. Venom is a substance that is toxic when it is injected directly in your bloodstream via very, a very sharp device. That can be the faint of a snake, it's a little viper, so you can see the fangs there. It can be the forcipules, so the pincers of a giant centipede, I'll show you one later. It can be the fangs of a spider, it can be the sting of a scorpion. So once the venom is injected in your bloodstream by something very sharp, it's, it's venom, not poison. So here, venom, here, poison, and here, get high. <laughs> Psychedelic toy. If you're ever thinking about licking toad, that's the species. The other one doesn't work, okay? Lick any other toad, you're going to be sick. <laughs> now, venom composition. Another thing is that a lot of people think that venom is venom. There are no difference. There are between different types of venom. That is not true. There are many different combination variations and different types of venom. So here are the main types. First of all, neurotoxins. So neurotoxins disable the central nervous system. Basically, they block the message that your brain tries to send to the rest of your body to move your muscles, to open your eyes, to, um, to actually open your lungs. Um, all these kind of messages can be disturbed by neurotoxins. An example of spider that's very good at that, it's the black widow. The black widow has a mainly neurotoxic venom. Then, cardiotoxin. So the cardiotoxins tend to produce cardiac arrhythmia. Cardiac arrhythmia, your heart doesn't beat regularly anymore. Now, if the cardiac arrhythmia is really bad, we tend to call it, to call it a cardiac uh, uh, arrest, simply. Your, your, your heart will stop beating. So cardiac arrhythmia, 
tends to be mild. If it starts to be severe, well, you can simply die. Then, necrotoxin. Necrotoxin, a toxin that will dissolve the tissues of your skin, your muscles, your kidneys, well, whatever organ or whatever thing they just meet. So, necrotoxin, I'll show you a spider that has very potent necrotoxin afterwards, uh, Sicarius terosus. Sicarius terosus, in Latin, means the terrible killer, or the terrible assassin. So, I'm going to introduce you to her, not too close, but, but you'll see her. Then, we have hemolytic venom. So, hemolytic venom, they basically change the clotting property of the blood, they can make your blood thinner, so basically you, you, you become... Um, Hemolytic, your blood will just ooze through your skin or will leak through the veins and arteries, or it can make your blood thicker, in which case your blood will be replaced by a kind of jelly and you will easily understand that that's not healthy. So, these are two things that can happen to your blood, but they also destroy blood vessels. So basically, your veins and arteries that are normally all nice and smooth will start to be like just dotted with little holes. That means that blood will start to ooze through the arteries, and once again, that's not healthy at all. Then we have pain inducers. So pain inducers, <laughs> everything's there, makes you feel the burn. Um, believe me, shit, yes, it burns. <laughs> I've been bitten a few times by different animals, and definitely you feel the pain inducers. Basically, those products will just shake the pain receptors to the extreme. So, of course, if something starts to shake my pain receptors, it hurts, you know? So, that's what will happen with these particular substances. Interesting to see that a lot of neurotoxin, for example, are not, are not painful at all. It's a different component that is actually painful in a venom. Then, we have uh, actually no allergens in spider venom. And that's something that's very interesting. You see, allergens are little components that make you swell up. So, if some of you are, for example, uh, sensitive to bee stings, well, you are actually not sensitive to the sting as such, you are sensitive to a particular part <coughs> of the venom, and that particular part of the venom is made out of a series of allergens. They basically give an um, uh, answer to your brain, your brain will think that there is something very wrong happening to you, and it's going to send so, um, a general message to your whole body saying, we have to get that product out of us. And then you start to swell up, and your throat will, your, your throat will swell up, your tongue will swell up, and at the end, uh, you can't breathe anymore. But in spiders, that doesn't happen. So it can happen to you if you get stung by a bee. It can happen to you if you get stung by a wasp. It cannot happen if you get stung, beaten by a spider. And that, of course, changes a lot of things, because it means that most spider bites cannot give you an anaphylactic shock. And most of the current controversy about the false black widow and some other spiders is that they've provoked, they've provoked anaphylactic shock. But they can't do it. So the answer is, no, we don't have mutant spiders. It wasn't a spider. That's going to be the answer for a lot of spider bite cases. Now, venom use. Something else that's very interesting is how do spiders use their venom? First good news, most defensive bites by a spider actually dry bite. So they do not inject venom. They just give you a little nip just to say, hey, don't approach me. I'm dangerous. But that's about it. So that's why a lot of cases of spider bite are also even when it's by fairly dangerous spiders, do not have any consequences. It's because it was a dry bite. Then, we have so different venoms for different purposes. You see, it's not the same venom, at least in certain spiders, between so, uh, an attack of a prey and a defensive bite. When they attack a prey, they don't have to inject pain inducers. When they try to defend themselves, they don't have to, for example, use paralytic but they will use a lot of pain inducers. So they can actually modulate the kind of venom they deliver depending on the situation. <coughs> That's fairly cool as well. It's actually something that has been found out quite recently. Then, it's important to know as well that for a spider it takes two days to three weeks to replenish its venom glands. That's why they're not willing to bite every time there is a threat. 
If they use venom every time there is a threat, they never have enough venom to actually kill a prey or a big meal. So they need to keep some of that venom. Then, the venom optimization hypothesis is something very interesting. It's been proved in spiders, it's been proved in ants, it's been proved in centipedes. And it says that in the case of spiders, so spiders use only the required amount to kill a prey. If it's a small prey, they won't use a lot of venom. They use only a tiny amount, just enough to kill that prey. If it's a larger prey, they use a larger amount of venom. Then, spiders choose prey depending on the prey sensitivity to the venom. They won't attack any prey just like that, by chance, no. It seems that they know how to make the difference between different types of prey. Give them a cricket or give them a cockroach. In many cases, the cricket is more sensitive than the cockroach to the venom. They will go for the cricket. They'll dismiss the cockroach. Why take a risk of retaliation by an animal that doesn't die immediately when actually you have another meal that will die instantly and that you can eat? You see, sometimes you need to get more small prey than just one big meal. That actually would be dangerous to catch. And spiders finally inject venom when it's most effective. You see, spiders do not inject venom just anywhere. They actually inject venom where it's going to hurt, where it's going to kill fast. So in most cases, spiders will actually manipulate the prey before killing it to make sure that they inject venom in the head, in the thorax, or close to the, uh, to the central nerve cord. Pretty clever as well for an animal that is 400 million years old. And in that picture, you can see actually a tarantula injecting venom in the head of a cricket. It's actually not even lifting the rest of the body. Just use the head and inject venom. Why go for the rest? Now, well, part four, deadly spiders. Beautiful black widows. It's another one. Also photographed in my office. Don't say anything to my colleague. Okay. <laughs> no, are tarantulas deadly? No. We need to clarify that. Short answer? No. Okay. So, let's see. There is a single species out of 850 species of tarantula with one single human fatality. So basically, we have only one example of one type of spider, once killing one, once killing one person, and only for the reason that the bite was directly there. Now, anything would bite you there. If there is even a tiny amount of venom, you're at risk of dying. Okay? It would be an ant. It could kill you if it bites you there. You have your airways just there. If you start to swell up even a little bit, you can die. So that's basically what happened in that case. And it was a child as well. So very small. The defenses, the natural defenses of the body were not particularly strong. So one accident that we know of in the whole of history, modern history, I don't think it's much. Now, they usually use physical strength rather than venom toxicity. So that means that because they're so big, they're so strong, well, the venom is actually not that powerful. They don't need that. Why should they use energy both in their muscle and in their venom when actually they just need one? Either the venom or the muscles. The tarantulas usually go for the muscles rather than the venom. Then, a lot of new world species have urticating <coughs> hairs. So they have kind of tiny little harpoons on their belly and they can just rub that off and then you have a cloud of those little hairs that are just flying <coughs> at the opponent's face and that usually results in a terrible itch. <coughs> so, once again, when you have weapons to actually defend yourself at a distance, why do you want to develop a super dangerous venom? Doesn't make sense. It's too costly. It takes too much resources. It takes too much energy and power from you. Then, they tend actually to avoid confrontation. They will not try to fight back. First, they try to run away. It's only when they're cornered and they really can't do anything that they will start displaying their fangs. So first thing, they raise the front of their body. They show their fangs to the opponent. Now, if the opponent, after that, still stupid enough to go and put his hand or her hand there, well, that's something else. Then they have to bite. And I can say stupid, but that means stupid enough to do it. <laughs> so, and the result was a bite. <laughs> so, 
uh, the bite is usually without medical concern, and the symptoms are usually similar to a flu. So a little bit of you know pain on your articulation, your elbows, your knees, your bones a little, your muscle can be a bit stiff. You might have a little bit of a blocked nose. You're gonna sneeze a few times. Now that's 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 not exactly dying. Now, okay? <laughs> so even if it's a really bad man flu. <laughs> <laughs> so. Symptoms are actually not that bad, and usually they result within 24 to 48 hours. So, very, very low incidence of medically significant bites from tarantulas. So, no tarantulas are not deadly. However, they are big things. They are big things, and when the big things and they're in your skin, now that hurts. So, okay, you're not gonna die, but it's gonna hurt. <laughs> then, any deadly spider at all? Yes. Yes, there are a few. <laughs> So here is the list of the few species that have killed people, and we're sure of it. So first, there is the Brazilian wandering spider, Phenatria. So that's the famous banana spider. First thing, banana spiders, well, usually do not arrive in Europe. There have been a couple of cases in the past five years, and, well, usually they are half dead. Too cold, no food, so they're not exactly dangerous at that stage. But Phenotria is capable of killing people. Well, we've seen that the usual banana spider, Phenotria fera, I think, has killed, I think, two people out of a study that included 422 cases. Two out of 422. Well, that's not much. Okay? Then, we have another type of Phenotria that, okay, has killed four people out of seven in the study. No? <laughs> I agree that one's dangerous. But the thing is that that particular species, Nigri venter, if I'm right, actually lives deep into the jungle. So cases are extremely rare. Like, you know, as long as you don't go to the spider, well, it's not going to come to you. So there are very, very, very few accidents. That's why the study was based on only seven people, because nobody was getting bitten otherwise. Then we have the black widow. So the black widow is fairly dangerous. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot something about the Brazilian wandering spider. I can't leave without saying that. When you get bitten by a Brazilian wandering spider, so yes, there is a chance that you're going to die. It's not going to It's not going to be fun. It's going to hurt. But one of the symptoms is priapism. And do you know what priapism is? Priapism is basically uncontrollable erection. <laughs> so, yes, you're going to die. But the past not a few hours. <laughs> So, not just so you know, I know it doesn't, it's, it doesn't work as, as an aphrodisiac. Some people have tried, they've regretted it, okay? So, just, just don't do it. Then the black widow. So yes, the black widow is toxic. We have a uh, few cases of mortality, but something that's very important to say, most of the mortality occurred before there were hospitals, before there was an antivenom, before actually respir respiratory help was available in most clinics. Now that all this first, uh, first help is there, nobody dies from black widows anymore, except in very remote areas. For example, in Australia, the last person to die from a black, from a black widow bite was decades ago. Since the antivenom has been developed, nobody died. So, they are not as dangerous as they used to be. Not because their venom has changed, but because we have adapted. And that changes a lot of things. Then the Sydney Funnel Web Spider. The Sydney Funnel Web Spider has killed people, usually kids. Okay? Now, since there is an antivenom once again, no adult has died from it. Unfortunately for children, it seems that children are amazingly uh, sensitive to the Sydney Funnel Web and the Tree Funnel Web uh, Spiders and they can die within minutes. So when that happens, of course, well, nothing can be done, even if an antivenom is available. Then we have, we have the brown recluse spider. The brown recluse spider is a spider that has a necrotic venom. So that one has killed a few people, basically by dissolving their kidney, which is probably not a very nice way to go. Um, they normally just produce massive sores on your skin. The venom will just enter in your flesh and basically has the key to enter the cell. So the venom just knock on the door of the cell. So the cell just says, oh, hello, you know, 
The venom enters, say, yes, what can I do for you? Ah, it's time to die. The cell just goes, okay, boom, dies. <laughs> it's basically this. They have the apoptic key to the cell. So basically, they can tell a cell that it's time to die. And uh, that means that the venom can travel from one cell to the other. Oh, hello, uh, just went to see your cousin there. I have to tell you something. What? Time to die. Boom. <laughs> then that goes to the next one. So that means that the sore can actually expand quite a bit for a long time. For the moment, only way to sort that out, surgery. Not to cut it. So not really fun, but that's, that's what could happen. And then we have uh, that particular tarantula that has killed one person. It's actually the Chinese bird eater. So Aplopelma huvenum. Uh, and that's a very large uh, tarantula that has very big fangs. And that species happened to be quite toxic and also very, very angry. I don't know what happened to that species. Problem in that childhood or something. <laughs> <laughs> they just tend to bite whatever is in front of them. So, well, there was one case, so with that one. And that's about it. Now, in total, we consider that there are about 200 species that are medically significant and could result in some serious medical outcome. 200 species out of 45,000. Now, that is a whooping 0.4% of all species. Not exactly the general idea that all spiders are dangerous. Only 0.4%. Okay? So that means that the remaining 99.6% cannot do anything to you. Which is a pretty good news. Now, can Irish spider bite people? Uh, in short, yes, they can. In fact, a fair few of them can. But most of you will never realize it because you will not experience it or you will get bitten and you will not even realize that it was a spider that bit you. The result of most of these bites is insignificant. Absolutely nothing. Not even a bit of redness. Nothing at all. But, for example, we have the cross-garden spider. You know that big, roundy spider that you find outside eating wasp? Yeah, that one can bite you. But she stays on the web. She's not going to do anything to you. We have the cellar spider. <coughs> so this is a pretty big uh, spider that actually hides um, in dark places. So, once again, not going to see it much. Likes caves, very dark sheds, things like this. And it's big enough for you to know that it's there. We have the woodlouse spider. That is a woodlouse spider. If you see it, you never forget it. It has massive fangs. So if you just see it, you don't want to touch it. It's, uh, it's as simple as that. The fangs are so big that you're like, no, that can bite. You can find them sometimes on the ground uh, in winter. They're actually looking for woodlouse, uh, woodlouse sweet. Then um, we, 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 we have, of course, the false black widow. I will speak about that afterwards. But interestingly, the giant house spider, that big spider that runs in front of you while you're watching, you know, a fantastic movie in the evening and creeps you out for the rest of the night. <laughs> that one has never beaten anybody. So next time you see that big spider crawling in front of you, you can actually just grab it, put it outside. No problem at all. We have no report of bite by this species. They seem to be incredibly gentle. Very, very reluctant to bite whatsoever. Then, so, of course, no fatalities ever reported, despite what the newspapers are saying. Nobody ever in the UK or in Ireland died from the bite of a local species of spider. Okay? Then, the symptoms, usually, if you get bitten by a local species, well, a bit of swelling, that can happen. Light nausea, that can happen if you're sensitive to the venom. Okay? If you're really sensitive, but just a little burp, and you'll be okay after that. <laughs> Localized pain, pain is usually just around the site of the bite, sometimes up to the joint, just above it. That happens. At most, so effects that are similar to a bee sting, and we have never recorded a single anaphylactic shock because they're spiders, and like I say, usually they don't produce anyway. It's not a result of, of uh, the symptoms. So, definitely no risk. And finally, the false black widow. I started with that and I shall finish with it. First thing, there are in fact four different species belonging to the same group. Okay? Three of them are native, one of them come from the Canary Islands and that's the one that scares everybody. Now the problem is that they never tell you that actually there are four species and that three of them are native and that we never had any problem with them. Okay? So, 
Um, da -da -da. It arrived, yes, in the UK in the late 19th century. For a long time, it stayed just on the coastal area of the south of the UK. And it's only uh, in the recent years that it started to travel north and then arrived in Ireland, probably in Dublin around 2007. And from there, it started to spread. And now you will find it in most of the major cities. So definitely, with Aileen, we found so a few specimens in Galway. And there are probably similar specimens in Limerick or Cork or Athlone or in all major cities. These guys so far cannot survive in the countryside, it's too cold. Like, you know, Irish weather, you're right from the Canary Islands, uh, no, no, <laughs> not staying. <laughs> so they live only in very protected environments that we've made, urban environments, and they're fairly up there because. They're kept warm and their uh, buildings act as windbreakers as well. So, proven symptom, proven, okay, not speculated by some weird newspaper, is sweating, so yes, you can sweat, bit of pain, redness, stiffness from the whole limb, so you just don't feel right, like, you know, your articulations are not great. Itchiness, now we've seen worse of the symptom, and then feeling of being unwell, for up to three days. So basically, you feel a bit woozy, you're not very well, but this has been only an extreme case. Most cases, nothing, almost nothing. A bit of redness, that's it. Tiny bit of a sore, that's what will happen. And you really have to push them far for them to bite. Okay? A spider has no reason to bite you just because you're sleeping quietly in your bed. Doesn't happen. So, most of the bites that have been attributed to the false black widow for the moment, they're definitely not spider bites. So nothing to fear there. And they are actually pretty cute spiders. So I can show you one afterwards, like say I have one over there, you'll see if she's super gentle. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so thanks a lot for that. You listen to me for a good while. And if you have a couple of questions, more than happy to answer them. Developed eyes, 
And because they need to catch prey, they have big eyes in front, and they need to have that depth of, of field, so that tree division. And very often, the brain development, so the intelligence level of many animals, is linked to their predatory habits and the fact that they have two big eyes in front that allows them to judge death. It seems that for some reason that helps brain development. All good? Yeah? A lot of them. Cannibalism is actually an excellent way to control populations. You see, when resources are limited, if you start to eat your brothers, your sisters, your parents, well, where is there? Uh, that means that once you've eaten them, there's going to be enough food left for you. All the little bugs that are crawling around. So it's an excellent way to first make kind of general selection between specimens of the same, uh, of the same batch. And uh, then after it means that the strongest specimen can eat, so yes, all their siblings, and they'll then have enough resource for sure to develop uh, till ad adulthood. Yep? One of the studies was that it was a vegetarian study? Yes, absolutely. Have they lost their fangs? Or? Uh, no, I think they still have their fangs. I know very little about that spider. Uh, very, very little. But uh, yes, it was described not very long ago, a few years ago, I'd say five years ago, something like this. And yeah, it's a vegetarian spider. I, I don't know what happened to that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's one out of 45,000. So something very special must have happened. But uh, I just have no idea what. Cool, gonna keep it here. So, and uh, thank you very much. And I'm gonna let James speak in there.